my nostalgic journey moves to the E400, still in pre-Micro Four Thirds era. I no longer have the camera, but I recall that it was smaller in size and lighter than the E1, but sported twice as many pixels. It was launched in September 2006, and it accompanied me on many travels. I live in Surrey, just outside the London conurbation, surrounded by beautiful woods and fields that are conveniently accessed for photography. I also live on a hill, about 600 feet above sea level. Consequently, I can reach my local landscape at most times, quickly taking advantage of light and weather conditions. The controlling force in landscape photography. Shooting into the light, as here, ESP metering has coped well with the high dynamic range of this image because of the predominance of highlights. The sun's starburst is not courtesy of a filter, but by partially obscuring it behind a tree. A neat trick to remember that also works with what rocks and buildings. Oh yes, this is chocolate box, but it is a much sought after view. The mountains, or fells to use the local term, are the Langdale Pikes, and they are not as high as they seem, no more than 2,500 feet above sea level. The viewpoint is Elter Water Common, and whilst some of you occasionally criticise my colours, sometimes created in post-production, I am supplying to a calendar market in which I am successful so I give them what they expect. You might think here too that the strong colours in this image make it saleable. It is not. It is not commercial. Why? It has a major flaw, namely the deep shadows on the left. I tried lightening them in post-production, but it didn't work. Here we get a different aspect of the Langdale Pikes from the last image. It is taken from a moorland road from Little Langdale that passes through a gap in the fells. If you have ever been to Blee Town, that is on the way. Just continue north, and this view will appear just before the descent into Great Langdale. Steam trains look more dramatic on a dull, even wet day. A bridge over the Bluebell Railway north of Hosted Kane Station is ideal for shots of trains pulling up an incline with a fine head of steam. Brave and maybe foolish photographers will stand immediately over the line, who should also consider video shots for added drama. I don't think that the E-400 had weather seals to protect it from the smoke and soot. Oh well, I survived, just about. This is a successful commercial picture. There is a clear difference between this type of shot and what I would submit to my local camera club. The biggest mistake I can make is to confuse these two disciplines. They are quite different and rarely come together. By now I am using centre-weighted metering with an optical finder and underexposing to beef up the colours for magazine publication. For this shot to work, everything needs to be sharp. Four thirds provided more depth of field than many larger formats, and aperture f8 helps but I am using the telephoto end of a zoom that reduces depth of field, so that doesn't help. Enter traditional photo techniques to save the day, a technique I learned in 1960 and it is still important today. Don't focus on the background. Don't focus on the foreground, but somewhere in between, around 100 feet. This is known as the hyperfocal distance that ensures sharpness even at f8. Remember, sharpness extends twice as much behind the focusing point than in front, and depending on the focal length of lens, 
infinity kicks in at around two to three hundred feet. So everything will be sharp beyond that point. Looking back on this shot, it is amazing to witness the lack of people at this popular spot. According to the metadata, it was taken just after 11.15, but as it is a National Trust property, it may have just opened to visitors. This is a good trick if a well-liked view is required without people. Get in as soon as it is open. I was also lucky with the weather. A picture postcard view if there ever was one. After many years, the mystery about this shot is the aperture. F-22. Why on earth did I use it? Its use was not necessary. It risks diffraction. In my defence, I can only assume that I had been shooting into the light and had forgotten to restore the aperture back to f8, the optimum setting for most lenses. The water here is tidal, and it is not high tide yet. I am standing on a hard where some motorists choose to park, thus avoiding parking charges. I wonder which ends up the most expensive. Worth waiting for a touch of theatre. And there is a tea shop not far away with a grandstand view. Back in August 2007, I organised a photographic holiday, 4HF holidays, in Cornwall, based at their hotel at St Ives. But this is Mausel, one of many picturesque fishing villages, and the weather for the entire week, which of course I arranged, was picture perfect. As mentioned earlier, I used centre-weighted metering with an optical viewfinder. The electronic finder arrived a little later, permitting the use of spot metering for greater accuracy, as now the preview, known as Live View, came from the camera's computer. A former Cornish industry was tin mining, and some of the shafts extended under the sea. No longer in use, these gaunt reminders are of a previous age, abandoned engine houses that took miners beneath the sea, and they can still be seen clinging precariously to the cliff edge. Notice again the combination of traditional photographic techniques to ensure sharpness throughout the image. Small aperture, wide-angle lens, and probably the hyperfocal distance. Another exercise in depth of field using similar techniques to the last shot. At low tide, St. Michael's Mount can be reached on foot via this causeway. Otherwise, it is by boat. By now, I was firmly entrenched in centre-weighted metering with an optical finder, and aperture priority too to control depth of field. Extended depth of field is firmly in evidence here at Stiperstones in Shropshire but now with the fabulous Zuiko 714 lens, an optic I don't normally advocate for landscapes, but it has certainly worked here, helped by the right kind of weather. Such a wide-angle optic will have an enormous depth of field, so essential for this type of shot. You might just make out Snowden on the horizon towards the left. Because of the generous support I received from Olympus, I have had the privilege to try the latest camera. This continues to this day with Micro Four Thirds, which no doubt will follow soon in this series. But I think the E3 will come first. <laughs>